I just want to be clear on this first class, and actually it's probably true for all of them. I'm not really here to teach you about being about the kings of Israel and Judah. What I'm really aiming to do today is to teach you about your coming kingship in the kingdom, about how you're going to be a leader in the kingdom. And I think the lessons from Jeroboam, Rehoboam, and Saul will help us to set our minds in the right mindset as we come out of this pandemic and back into the world. Now, to be honest, I always had a picture of the kingdom as a place of rest. I, I always thought that once the Lord's enemies were destroyed and, and the kingdom was established, I always had that vision of tending vines and fig trees and, and having my ease finally in the kingdom. So I don't know how you visualize the kingdom, but I always thought that in the kingdom we would have rest. I remember passages like Hebrews 3 and 4 that say we're entering into God's rest. Or you may think of Jesus where he said, come unto me and I will give you rest. Now, the number in front of you is one I want you to think about. There are 7.9 billion people living in the earth today. That's almost up a billion from 2011. That's well over, and this is an important number, that's well over half the people that have ever lived since the flood are living today. Well, what do you think? How are 7.9 billion people going to learn about God and his son Jesus? How are they gonna learn how to live? In 1 Peter 2, 9, we read, but you are a special people, a holy nation, priests and kings, a people given up completely to God so that you may make clear the virtues of him who took you out of dark into light. That's us, brothers and sisters, making clear the virtues of him our Lord Jesus, to a world around us in the kingdom. You look at 1 Peter 2.9, and that's your job description when we enter into the kingdom, to make clear the virtues of the Father and the Son. And, and just so we are clear, on the right side of the screen, there's a few passages which I know you know. Revelations 1.6, thou hast made us kings and priests, or Revelation 5, verse 10, and you made us kings and priests. You're really no different than the kings we're going to look at this morning, Jeroboam, Rehoboam, and Saul. In fact, right down to the anointing of the kings, you too have been anointed. In 2 in Second Corinthians 1.21, this is from Young's literal Bible. He who is confirming, in other words, making sure, making firm. He who is making firm you with us into Christ and did anoint us is God. So if, if there's a background theme you can carry through these talks is that you were a leader in preparation for the kingdom. You are no different than these kings in waiting that we're gonna read about, right down to your anointing through baptism and your faithfulness. Now we're gonna talk more about this at the end of the class, but it's important to keep that in our minds that we are kings, we're leaders in waiting for the coming kingdom. So we're gonna pull some common themes out of Saul, Rehoboam and Jeroboam and how they fight their enemies from outside and within. And I also want to just say, for all three kings, we're really only going to cover what we term in the United States, the honeymoon period. That, that's usually just before and just after a leader enters office. 
They're, they're given a hundred days or a small period of time. So brothers and sisters, we're just going to look at the beginning of these three men's kingships and see what we can learn from them. Now I have one more thing I want to share before we get going. I don't know, have you ever worried or wondered about this verse? John 21, 25. And here John records, and Jesus did such a number of other things that if everyone was recorded, it's my opinion that even the world itself is not great enough for the books there would be. Think about what John is telling us there. What he's saying is, Jesus' father edited out a world full of books about him to just a few gospels so that all these other things we read in scripture could be read and understood. So remember that when you're reading scriptures, when you're reading genealogies and places and buildings and, and all the little details that scripture gives us, the father put that there for a reason. He took his son out so these details could be included. And I think that's really important. And I think that's why the kings we're going to look at, Saul, Rehoboam, Jeroboam, Ahab, Jehoshaphat, Manasseh, and Ahaz, probably kings you're not very familiar with, that there's things we can learn from them. Everything is important. Now, these three kings, when you think about it, really represent our calling, do they not? Saul desired to be a king long before he met Samuel, right? So way before Saul was anointed, in his heart, Saul desired to be a king. He wanted it, like us. You know, we can relate to that. Rehoboam, well, he was just going to be king simply because he was born in a kingly family. Uh, just like Christadelphians sometimes are just expected to come into the truth. They're born in the truth. It's all they know, and it's just a given that they'll be baptized and enter the saving name of our Lord. And Jeroboam represents a third type of calling. He was in Egypt. He, he kind of represents those called out of the world into the truth. And, and I think we can all relate to that too. So these three kings represent the callings we have all had. And another thing about these kings is they are the first. And by that I mean they're the first in their kingships. Now, now, we know in scripture, whenever something occurs the first time, usually it's pretty important that there's a lesson there for us. So whenever I find a word or a place used the first time, it might be used for a reason. And, and so I always keep that in mind in my studies. Well, Saul was the first king, the captain of God's people, Judah and Israel. Jeroboam. He was the first king of Judah after the, the division. And Rehoboam, he was the first king of the southern tribes. Saul and Jeroboam were both told by the Lord that their kingdoms would be established, that they could become lasting, sure, and firm. Now, just kind of relate that to yourself. Brothers and sisters, your kingdom that's coming will be lasting, sure, and firm. The other current that runs behind these classes is understanding that in the truth, we will be saved, that our salvation is there only to be lost by walking away. Now, let's first turn to Saul. Young Saul, and you can imagine him living in a town with Philistines nearby or perhaps even occupying, 
just dreamed of a day when his town and his tribe would be free from Philistine aggression and tyranny. They were bullies. They, they would take what they want. They took captives from the Israelites. If somebody caught their eye, they were taken and made into a slave. And Saul couldn't wait to have them driven from the land. Saul imagined all those captives made free. Saul imagined the land one day at peace because the enemies of the Lord had been driven away. Now, I want to do just like a quick digression, okay? A lot of times when we read about Saul, we think of him as a placeholder till David comes along. That's the wrong way to think of Saul. Saul could have become the greatest king in Israel. And David? David could have been the greatest general in Israel. David could have been one of Saul's mighty men if Saul had remained faithful. Now, another thing when we think of Saul is we're just doing an introduction is there's lots of echoes from Exodus in the early part of Saul's life. And I believe God chose Saul, and I believe Samuel believed this, to finish the work of Moses and Joshua. That's why Saul was chosen. And, and just think of some of the parallels. Uh, before Moses came on the scene, Israel was suffering, and their cries ascended to heaven. The exact same language is used of Saul before he's chosen king. Both Moses and Saul were rejected to be leaders. And if you think about the battles of Saul, Saul fought the ancient enemies of Israel. He fought the enemies from the Exodus, from the crossing into the land. He fought the Philistines. He fought the Amalekites. And we know Saul, trying to please the Lord, misguided as he was, even fought the Gibeonites to whom Joshua had made a treaty. These three nations echo all the way back to the Exodus and before as ancient enemies of Israel. And Saul is thinking of the Exodus. Now, if you're thinking, well, how are the Philistines an enemy of God, the enemy of Israel from the Exodus? Think of what Ezra wrote in Chronicles. You almost don't notice this when you do it in your readings. But here we have a list of Ephraim's sons. And then the part I have highlighted, at the middle of your screen, and Zabad, his son, and Shuthaleah, his son, and Ezer, and Elid, whom the men of Gath, that were born in that land slew because they came down to take away their cattle. And Ephraim, their father, mourned many days, and his brethren came to comfort him. While Ephraim, son of Jacob, was still alive in Egypt, the Philistines came down, stole all his cattle, and killed his sons. And Ephraim was bereft of children, like his father Jacob was, in a sense, when Joseph was taken. And Ephraim mourned because he had no seed left because the Philistines had killed them. And what's even more interesting is in Genesis 50, 23, it appears that Joseph was alive when Ephraim's children were killed. Because it says Joseph saw Ephraim's children and we just read of them, they were all killed of the third generation. I believe that third generation had not happened yet. It wasn't until Ephraim had more children that that generation came. So Joseph even saw the Philistines as an enemy. So I believe destroying the Philistines was Saul's first mission and as you recall, that was one of the reasons he was made uh, the king. Now, I also said that Saul wanted to be king before he met Samuel. 
And you might say, well, how do you understand that to be? Well, in 1 Samuel 9, 19 and 20, we know what happens. Saul's father, Kish, had lost some asses, and Saul and a servant went to look for them. And they were away three days with no luck. And finally, the servant says, let's go talk to the seer, Samuel. And so Saul and his servant go to Samuel. And when Samuel meets him, that's where we're picking it up. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me into the high place. For ye shall eat with me today, and in the morning I will let thee go and tell thee all that is in thine heart. As for the asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, for they are found. You, you see what that passage is telling us? The desire of Saul's heart at that moment wasn't on his father's donkeys. It was on something else. And in the morning, as they're leaving, Samuel sends the servant ahead. And in 1 Samuel 10, 1, Samuel took a vial of oil, poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? That's what Saul wanted. Saul wanted to be a king. He wanted to be the first king. And it was to drive away the Philistines. So these two verses show you what was in Saul's heart. It wasn't the lost animals of Kish. It was being king. Brothers and sisters, being king, being a leader in God's kingdom should be the desire in our heart to bring peace to God's kingdom, to fight against the evils of this world and to finally subdue them. That's what Saul wanted. And brothers and sisters, we should want that too. Are you preparing for that day that's coming? You know, in Psalm 37, verse four, and I'll read it to you. So will your delight be in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desire. If your desire is to be in the kingdom, if your desire is to bring peace on this earth, to teach 7.9 billion people, or your share of that, God will give you that desire. He made Saul a king. Now, after he was anointed, Samuel gives Saul some signs and instructions. And it's helpful if we read them. And I don't have a verse to show you, but it's 1 Samuel 9, verses 1 through 9. And listen to what Samuel told Saul to do carefully. He says, when you leave, you're going to meet two men. And these two men are going to tell you your father's worried sick about you, which incidentally tells you how dangerous it was in Saul's kingdom or, or in Samuel's life. The Philistines were a ready and present danger so that his son, who was a giant himself, his dad worried about him. Three days and he's not home, something bad happened. That tells you how dangerous it was in Saul's day from the Lord's enemies. That was sign number one. Number two is he would then meet three men carrying three kids three loaves of bread and wine, and they would give him two loaves of bread. The third sign, then you'll arrive at the hill of the Lord and the Philistines have a garrison there. That's a hint. And then number four, God's spirit will fill you up. And here's the instruction then do as occasion serve you. The Israelites wanted a king to fight the Philistines. Samuel gave all the signs necessary to assure Saul he was the king, including being filled with the spirit. And then he says, when all that happens, when you're done, go to Gilgal 
wait seven days for me. Now, if you think about it, signs one, two, three, four, five, they all happened. And then Saul does nothing. When the spirit fills him up with the prophets, he does nothing. He goes home. He doesn't go to Gilgal. He doesn't wait seven days for Samuel. He's hiding his light. He was chosen and he's already put a bushel on himself. As future leaders, as kings in waiting and, and rulers coming, we need to let our light shine out. Now, I want to tell you what I think Samuel was thinking. We get a very good glimpse of Samuel and where he wanted Israel to go. And it's pretty easy to guess when you think about the signs. Samuel wanted Saul to destroy the garrison of the Philistines, either by himself or Saul and his servant, which I think was true, those two, or even Saul and his servant and the prophets of the Lord. We know what would happen if Saul destroyed a Philistine garrison. The Philistines would gather together against Israel. So after destroying the garrison, I believe Samuel wanted, to, wanted Saul to go to Gilgal. And at Gilgal, Saul would, or Samuel would gather all Israel together, just as he did earlier in his life. And when the Philistines heard Israel had gathered together, just like the previous incident, they would come to war with the Israelites. And here's the reason Gilgal is important. From the exact spot that Joshua stood when Israel crossed into the Jordan, from that point, Saul would stand up head and shoulders above the people and fight the victory against the Philistines. None of that happened. But you know, in a couple chapters, we're going to be, read about one of Saul's sons, Jonathan, with his servant, who destroy a garrison of the Philistines, which causes the Philistines to gather together and come against Israel. That's what Samuel wanted to happen with Saul. And I think this is what would have happened if Saul had been obedient. If you can, open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 4. Joshua 4, and we're going to start at verse 19. And the people came up out of Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, encamped in Gilgal on the east of Jericho. We're going to keep reading. And those 12 stones, stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, when your, when, your children shall ask, you, when your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then shall ye let your children know, saying, Israel came over this day from Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan before you until you were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea which he dried up before us until we were gone over. That all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, and that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. That was a direct message to Saul. He went back to the reminder that God was with Israel to fear God, to do what the Lord commanded. And then chapter 5, verse 1. And it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until they were passed over, that their heart melted. Neither was there any spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. And I believe when Saul and Israel at Gilgal reaffirmed the covenant, the nations would have melted before them. 
and Saul would have went forth and fought the enemies of the Lord. That's what Samuel was expecting to happen. If Saul had only trusted and believed, all the problems he faced later would never have happened. There would be no Goliath if he had trusted in the Lord that day. There would be no witch of Endor that would bring him down to the earth if he had listened to the Lord this day. You know, when we don't act on problems, when we just push them down the road, they tend to fester and grow worse. Nothing that Samuel really expected to happen, happened. What a glorious day that could have been if Saul had trusted in the Lord. And you know, if you think of these incidents, this explains why Saul was afraid when Israel, when he was presented to Israel to be king. Remember when Samuel gathered Israel together and, and they looked for Saul and he was found in the baggage. Do you ever think about why Saul was hiding in the baggage? Was, was he just shy? Was he bashful? The reason Saul was hiding was he wasn't afraid of Israel. Saul was afraid of Samuel. And that's a pattern that will be repeated again and again in Saul's life because he's never trusting, he never acts fully. Saul's hiding from Samuel, not the people. He hadn't waited the seven days which ironically we'll repeat a little later in Saul's life. All right, so let's stop talking about Saul. A couple lessons we can pick up from his early kingship. One is, is Saul among the prophets? That's what the people saw when they saw Saul dancing and singing with the spirit filling him. What, what's odd about that is he doesn't answer them. Of course, Saul is among the prophets. Of course, he's the Lord's servant. He should have spoken up. Instead, again, he has the bushel. He's not associating himself with the Lord. And we see that when he gets home and his uncle asks, well, what did Samuel tell you? Saul doesn't tell him what Samuel said about being king. He allows the light inside him to be hidden. You know, it's, it wasn't a good start. It, it, it was actually the wrong way to start his kingship. You know, Brother Dan Langston in my ecclesia said, and I wrote this down, I thought it was a great point. If Saul had sought for the Lord as diligently as he sought for the witch of Endor, he might have found God. And that was where Saul was lacking. He wasn't diligent in his search for the Lord and learning to trust and depend on the Father. Now, think about yourselves. Think about me. Would my neighbor say, is Steve Cheatham among the prophets? Is my light shining out to the world around me? Well, what about your neighbors? Are we among the prophets? Are we people of the Lord or not? Well, next we're going to talk about Rehoboam. We know Rehoboam was Solomon's son. And brothers and sisters, Rehoboam was absolutely, completely unprepared to be a ruler, a king. Rehoboam had not given his coming kingship any thought at all. No preparation work. You know, earlier we had talked about 7.9 billion people living today. Well, we don't know exactly how many people were living in, Re in Rehoboam's time. But in 1 Kings 4.20, Israel and Judah are described as sand by the sea in multitude. Obviously not 7.9 billion, but there were a lot of Israelites and he hadn't given any thought 
in leading them, changing them, and that neglect would cost him the nation. Rehoboam indirectly was responsible for losing the Northern Kingdom. Perhaps not in the way you're thinking right now, we're gonna talk about it in a minute, but he was responsible for losing the people in the Northern tribes because he had given his kingship so little thought. Now, we don't know what happened to Solomon. There's no parting words of Solomon like David. It's suspected he died suddenly. And Rehoboam was thrust into the kingdom, into his kingship. And it seems like he was completely surprised by all of it. He, he wasn't ready. You know, it was a thief coming in the middle of the night, and he wasn't ready. In 2 Chronicles 13, verse 7, And there were gathered unto him vain men, the children of Belial, and have strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, when Rehoboam was young and tenderhearted and could not withstand them. Now, the point of this verse is, Rehoboam, when he became king, is described as young, tenderhearted. Solomon himself uses those words, those exact words to describe somebody who's a boy, a child, a youth, perhaps immature. But Rehoboam wasn't a young man. He was 41 years old when he ascended the throne of Israel. You know, his father Solomon used that word young as in young and tenderhearted, almost exclusively for children that need training, children that need instruction and correction. These things were lacking in Rehoboam. Solomon had done none for his son. So a 41-year-old man ascended to the throne and he's described as young and tenderhearted and perhaps what really is striking about this is the passage we read was spoken of by his son when he became king at the ripe old age of 21. So you think of it, a 21-year-old is describing his 41-year-old dad when he ascends the throne as a child, as young, unprepared, a boy, a lad. This explains a lot about Rehoboam in the household of Solomon. There's a verse, and perhaps Solomon was thinking of his own son when he wrote this in Ecclesiastes. Unhappy is the land whose king is a boy, whose rulers are feasting in the morning. It is speaking of a young person, immature, feasting all day, living it up. Unhappy is the land whose king is a boy, and that's what befell Israel. Now, perhaps the most consequential events to happen to Rehoboam and the nation is when Rehoboam is thrust onto the throne, when he's put in the spotlight. Rehoboam travels up to Shechem to be confirmed as king. And when he gets to Shechem, he finds out that there are conditions from the people. The people want their taxes reduced. They want the draft of people, of physical workers to be removed or lessened. And they said, remove the burdens of your father. And, and we all know the story, and, and this is where I want to emphasize a couple important lessons. So Rehoboam goes home, and we know what he does. He asked the old men who advised his fathers, what should I do? How should I answer this people? And they gave a great answer. They said, if you serve the people, speak kindly to them. Do what they're asking. 
they're going to serve you forever. That, that was pretty good advice. I went through some management training and we were reading books from the Harvard Business School. And one of the, the books I read would describe this philosophy of the old men as a manager with emotional intelligence, a servant manager are terms used today. And that's what Solomon's advisors advised Rehoboam. Be a servant leader. Speak kindly to the people. And we know, then he asks his friends, well, what do you think I should do? Uh, and they say, well, you need to be tougher than your father. You need to be more extreme. You have to increase their burdens, multiply their punishments. Now let's just pause for one minute. Young people always get a bad rap about this verse, always. I just wanna remind you that these young people were in their early 40s like Rehoboam. We're not talking about 15 or 18 year olds who would have had the sense to answer Rehoboam wisely. We're talking about spoiled middle-aged men that grew up with Rehoboam and gave him terrible advice. They were feasting with him and they wanted to continue that lifestyle. So it's nothing about young people not giving good and sage advice. These were old men, 40, in their 40s, late 30s. In fact, the way the young people spoke almost sounds like an echo of Exodus again, doesn't it? It's, it's like Pharaoh, the tally of the bricks shall not diminish. All right, now brothers and sisters, we're gonna have a quick test. Uh, I'm not gonna risk doing this electronically by voting, but virtually, I want you to check the box of whose advice was the best. Was it A, Solomon's old advisors? Was it B, Rehoboam's friends? What do you think? Whose advice was the best? Well, I told you it was a trick question. All the advice Rehoboam received that day was wrong. What did Rehoboam forget to do? He doesn't consult with God. He doesn't go to the Lord in prayer. His prayer life was nil. When problems happened, he doesn't turn to the Lord. And tragic consequences resulted from that. It's not A, it's not B, it's C, turning to the Father. If Rehoboam had planned for that day, planned for the day when he entered into his kingdom, things would have been completely different. And again, the lessons there for us, are we planning for the kingdom and our leadership. Now, God had already chosen Rehoboam. He'd been anointed by God's prophet. He was the rightful heir. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm confusing Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Let's stop and redo. God chose Jeroboam to be king of Israel, right? When Solomon was alive, Jeroboam was anointed by God's prophets. Jeroboam was told he would inherit Herod, the northern tribes, and that he was the rightful heir. God already guaranteed it to Jeroboam. And everybody knew Jeroboam was going to be the king in the north because when Rehoboam goes up to Shechem, Jeroboam had already left Egypt and is there to receive his kingdom. All of this was of the Lord. And Rehoboam knew it. Now, some of the best advice I've heard about studying scripture was given by Brother Peter King. And, and Brother Peter says, always imagine yourself in that situation, e either watching it unfold or being one of the participants. Use your imagination. So I'd like to imagine for you how option C might have unfolded. 
how things could have been different. So in my version, you have Rehoboam and his advisor standing up on a platform before all the people. And Rehoboam says, brothers and sisters, my father Solomon turned away from serving the Lord and he served idols. And Yahweh said he would take away the kingdom from him and give it to Jeroboam, leaving just Judah for the sake of his servant, David. And then from the platform, he would summon up Jeroboam to come forward. And he'd look at Jeroboam and he, I don't know if they shook hands then, but he would shake his hand in my imagination and said, Jeroboam, we're brothers. Let's live in peace. Let's together clean the land of all the idols that are left over from my father. And let's serve the Lord together. Jeroboam, let's worship Yahweh freely at the place Yahweh chose to put his name. Jeroboam, this day, let's confirm this covenant with you as king before the Lord and make a covenant of peace. And I can imagine that working very effectively. And if Rehoboam had thought about it, if he had realized that the Lord was going to keep his word, remove the northern tribes, what better thing could he say than that? That was the correct answer. And I think Rehoboam was just scared to do it. You know, in, in Israel's history later on, we read of Zedekiah, one of the last kings. And Zedekiah knew what was right. He believed in God. He listened to God's word. But even his own words, he was afraid of the other people. And he chose not to do what the Lord commanded. As did his ancestor Rehoboam. Rehoboam doesn't do that because he had given no thought to the coming kingdom. Well, what follows? Warfare, destruction. Not only did the 10 tribes split, which was of God, but eventually they are so full of idolatry that the nation goes downhill from that moment. When Rehoboam spoke his actual words, option B, the kingdom in the north was lost. Jesus says, and, and we've alluded to this, behold, I come as a thief in the night. The kingdom's going to come suddenly to us. So think about the things we're putting off. I didn't realize there was going to be break rooms, but it would be an interesting discussion to see what are ways we can start now preparing for the kingdom? Are you ready? What are things we need to do? Now, I want to move on to Jeroboam quickly. Our own writers don't portray Jeroboam accurately, uh, at least none that I have found. Jeroboam is described as stealing the kingdom. Jeroboam's described as being a traitor, someone who took something that wasn't his. One, one brother wrote of Jeroboam as an interloper, getting involved in something he had no right to be involved in. That is wrong. He was the rightful appointed heir by the father. Just like God has called you and anointed you. You have been chosen by God you too have responded to the call. And despite the bad rap that Jeroboam gets, he is the only king, he is the first, as it were, of the first, to have thought about his kingship and prepared. He was ready to become a ruler. In 1 Kings 12, 25, we read, then Jeroboam made Shechem, made the town of Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim a strong place. And he was living there. And from there, he went out and did the same to Penuel. So again, it's his honeymoon period, so to speak. It's the beginning of his throne. 
and two cities are described as being the focus of his attention. Why? Remember, God edited out his son Jesus from a world full of books so we could read 1 Kings 12, 25. What's the father trying to tell us from this? What was Jeroboam thinking in his mind? There are thousands of cities in, in the northern tribes. Why Shechem and Penuel? What was Rehoboam thinking of? We know Shechem was the first stop in the land for Abraham. If you think of it, it would kind of invoke the feelings of Ellis Island that we might have towards our ancestors entering the United States. It was his starting point in the Holy Land. It was at Shechem that Abraham received the promises, right? Not just promises, but brothers and sisters, our hope. Help us, Israel. The promises were given in Shechem. The first altar to God was given in Shechem. Shechem's the place where Esau and Jacob reconciled peacefully, where they experienced unity for the first time. Are you starting to see what Rehoboam's thinking when he focused attention on Shechem? But it goes on. Shechem's the place where the idols were purged out of Jacob's household. Shechem was a royal city. It was given by Jacob to his firstborn son of Rachel and was given to Joseph. So of course Shechem would be his capital. Jeroboam thought about being king and he was prepared. And you know, we, we had read the very part of Joshua entering the land before Jericho. Not much longer, Joshua brings the people to Shechem and the question that was asked at Shechem was, which God will you serve? That's the lesson Jeroboam was trying to get across to the northern people, trying to mold them into thinking of themselves as a new country, to take pride in what had happened before, to realize how special the northern tribes were in their service to God and the history of the truth. Jeroboam had a plan. But what about the other city? What about Penuel? Penuel's the place where Jacob wrestled the angel. And it's where Jacob learned to depend on God. Remember, his hip was knocked out of joint. Every step, Jacob would remember that angel and that he needed to depend on the Lord first. This is where the nation was born. This is where Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So again, Jeroboam's trying to get them to think as a nationality, as a new nation. And he takes them to Penuel, where the name Israel was first given. And now the nation of Israel springs from that city. You know, what a great start. Jeroboam was a spiritual thinker. You, you can understand why God chose him to be king. In fact, Jeroboam, based on what we know, may have been in Jerusalem, may have stood in the temple when the Lord's presence filled it, and it was so glorious, so bright, the people were driven back. Jeroboam may have worked on the temple. He was old enough. He was industrious enough. And he may have been there, when the Lord's presence filled it. Yeah, that's really exciting. That gives you an idea of who Jeroboam was. So it seems like Jeroboam was really prepared for the kingdom, right? Or, or was he? In 1 Kings 12, 25 through 33, and I'll just leave this up for you, but what had happened was Jeroboam realized the people were going to go to Jerusalem to worship. And when they did, he was afraid they would turn back to Rehoboam and that they would kill him. Suddenly, ever so suddenly, Jeroboam stopped believing that God would save him. He doubted 
that God had truly called him. He didn't trust in the Lord anymore. And we know what he did. He, he built false altars and places of worship in the north and south, removed the Levites, appointed the basest of men to be their spiritual leaders. On that day, when his fear overcame him, when he stopped trusting in the Lord, he lost his family, he lost his throne, and he lost his life. Jeroboam did not believe God would save him. His doubts gnawed away at him. And I can relate to that. Sometimes we think, well, we're not good enough to be in the kingdom. And we doubt our calling. You know, in the end, Jeroboam's mentioned in scriptures over a hundred times. And it's always to remind us of his faithlessness his lack of trust in the Father. So if ever there was a lesson to learn from this king who started off so good, better than Saul, better than Rehoboam, is to trust that God will save you through whatever is coming in this world. Now, we're going to take another test, and, and I thank you for bearing with me. So again, we have some virtual check boxes for you. Uh, and I got this idea from Brother Harry Whitaker in one of his books. Here's the question, brothers and sisters. And you need to answer it. I, I should have held off on the slide for a minute. But I want you to answer this immediately without giving it any thought. Brothers and sisters, will you be in the kingdom of God? Yes or no? Now think about your answer. If you're struggling with this, if you said no, if, if you were kind of hoping it was an option C, maybe, you're going to struggle a bit. You can relate to Jeroboam. Well, how do you convince a Jeroboam or you that you've been called, you've been baptized, and you will be in the kingdom? How do you tell somebody that? How do you get a Jeroboam to believe that God will save you. It's actually a full class. Uh, but there's three verses I want to look at really quick. The first is 1 John 2, 28. It's on the right-hand side. My dear children, live in him. If we do this, we can be without fear on that day when Christ comes again. We're on the left of your screen in Colossians 1, 21 through 23. And I'm just going to read the highlighted areas. But now he has made you his friends again so that he could present you to himself. And how's he going to present us to himself? As people who are holy, blameless, without anything that would make you guilty before him. And how does Paul finish it up in verse 23? It's underlined. You must not let anything cause you to give up hope in the kingdom. Now, we have a passage in Jude, and before I actually read it, I just need to apologize to my family, because I had asked them for some pictures, and I just realized I haven't put the pictures on the screen. And you'll understand why in a moment. Jude 1, starting at verse 24. God is strong, and he can keep you from falling. He can bring you before his glory without any wrong in you and give you great joy. He is the only God, the one who saves us. To him be glory, greatness, power, authority through Jesus Christ our Lord for all time past, now and forever. God will keep us spotless. He will keep us from falling. Do you know what that really means, keep us from falling? It means he will keep us unfallen. 
And the pictures I alluded to was of my family, the Cheatham's, brother Dave Cheatham and his family, and, and the Langston family from Houston floating in the Dead Sea. And in the Dead Sea, it's very difficult to drown because the Dead Sea pushes you up. It keeps you unfalling, unsinking. And that's what God does to us from death. He is pushing us, lifting us up from death to save us. God is keeping us unfallen. So will you be in the kingdom of God? Brothers and sisters, the answer is yes. You have to trust and believe. Of course we don't deserve it. Nobody watching this podcast, nobody in any of your meetings deserves to be in the kingdom, period. But despite that, he will make us appear before the Father without any wrong. If, if anything, I'd like to recommend a podcast to you. It's Good Christadelphian Talks. Brother Levi, Chris, and Brian do a great job. Listen to the podcast number 57, The Atonement in Daily Life by Harry Tennant. Can't recommend anything better than to listen to Brother Harry about why you need to trust in God. God wants to save you. Now, I've cut myself a little short but this last section, brothers and sisters, is the most important. So I thank you for bearing with me so long. If anything, please be the most attentive now. That This has literally been the most helpful thing to myself in fighting the world. So how does the Father keep us unfallen? Because we all are battling. We're either battling enemies outside or enemies within. How do we keep sin at bay. We know that Jesus told this parable of the widow to tell us to be persistent in prayer, right? That, that this widow wearied her judge and finally the judge gave in, gave in because she was, he was wearied by her persistence and asking him to avenge her of her enemy, of her adversary, right? Now you're thinking, what does this have to do with anything? Well, the principle is before God, we are to pray and be persistent in our prayers to him and he'll hear us. And that's often misunderstood that we can pray for anything and God will give it to us if we ask enough. That's not what Jesus is saying here. And to prove it, oops, Think of the readings we had last month in Deuteronomy. It's Deuteronomy 3, 25 and 26. And Moses is persistently asking the father to enter the promised land. And finally, the Lord says, do not speak to me of this matter again. Stop. And you think, well, how do I relate being persistent in prayer to the father to what the father just said to Moses about don't bother me anymore with this prayer, this petition of yours. Don't say another word about it. It, it really does seem like a contradiction, does it? doesn't it, brothers and sisters? But when you see a contradiction, write it down. And we had talked about this in our Tuesday night readings at my meeting, and it occurred to me the answer. The answer is the verse in front of you. The one prayer God will always answer is avenge me of my adversaries. Help me fight sin, Father. Drive sin away from me. That's your adversary. That was this widow's adversary. Sin, which so easily besets us. And the point is, we are to pray for sin to be driven out. We need to fight that battle. And I want to share some things with you quickly about how I have fought sin and what's worked and what wasn't. 
and, and just to tie it in with our class. In Revelation, it says that there's going to be mortals. We, we know that there will be mortals in the kingdom. But in Revelation, it also says that sin will be bound up for a thousand years. Have you ever thought how that's going to happen? I mean, all of you, everybody connected today will be a king in the kingdom, a ruler, a leader. How are you going to reduce sin to an exception rather than as abundant as it is in the world today? What's going to happen to cause sin to go away? Well, the first thing I think is obvious, all the distractions that cause us to sin, the idols, will be removed. But is that enough? Even with the idols removed in, in the wilderness and also in Israel, the people still sinned. So just removing distractions wasn't enough to keep people from sinning. In the wilderness, the Israelites saw Mount Sinai full of flames, scorching heat up and down the mountain. They heard the voice of God. The voice of the Lord told them what to do and not to do. They had also seen many wonders of the Lord in the Exodus, in the wilderness, and in Egypt. So hold that thought. Do you think in the kingdom God's simply going to say, or the Lord Jesus, stop sinning to everybody in the world, and that'll work? It, it hasn't worked yet. They heard the Father who told them, thou shalt, and they didn't listen. Do you think they'll listen anymore in the kingdom when the Lord Jesus says, thou shalt? That's not enough to keep people from sinning. How are you going to help 7.9 billion people? How are you going to remove sin, to deaden it? and so many people. What will you tell them, brothers and sisters? I'd like to start with my grandma. Not my physical grandma, but I want to illustrate this very quickly. And it's a silly example. But it was a lust to the flesh. It, at work, we have a vending machine like this that had grandma's cookies, and I was addicted to them. And, and brothers and sisters, just to be clear, if this was a sin, I did everything you should do to avert sinning. I tried to stay away from them. I didn't carry dollar bills in my pocket. I stopped carrying change. I wouldn't even go near the break room where these cookies were. But eventually when I found myself bored or stressed or tired, I would turn to the vending machine and buy a cookie. Now, that's a silly example for a cookie, but the same is for, for sin. We do all the standard things. We try not to do it. We try to fill our minds with other things. We stay away from it. We try not to give it opportunity, but we still fall. And I still continue to eat these cookies until I had heard about a study and read it. Brothers and sisters, this is a very basic thing, and we're going to talk about it in another class. But this has kept me from eating grandma's cookies for nine years. And it also kept me from doing sins, sins that troubled me for nine years. And what I do is I talk to myself. I used to say, I, I really shouldn't eat those cookies. But I've learned to say, I don't eat grandma's cookies. As you could say, I don't look upon a woman and lust after her in my heart. That's how Jesus phrased it. Job said the same thing. I don't do this. I don't do that. And it especially works well with sin. And, and here's why. And, and there was actually some dramatic studies to prove this. And it goes deeper than just avoiding sin. It's taking ownership 
and self-control of your own life. Researchers conducted a study about temptation. And I forget what the particular temptation was. I think it was related to food. And, and one half of the group was told, whenever you're tempted, say, I can't eat grandma's cookies. And the other half were told, I don't eat, you know, fill in the blank, grandma's cookies. And surprisingly, the group that was told I can't failed almost two thirds of the time. The group that was told I don't were successful two thirds of the time. And it was so startling, they did another study. This time it was related to exercise. And they had three groups. They had one group that was a control group and this group of people were told, just go exercise, get healthy, nothing else, no advice. Second group was told, you know, say I can't miss the gym. I can't not exercise today. And the third group was saying, I don't miss exercising at the gym. And here's what's ironic. The control group with no strategy given were successful three out of, three out of 10 times, almost, 30, almost a third, 30%. The I can't group were only successful 10% of the time. They were worse off for saying I can't than the group that says, that wasn't told to say anything. And then the group who was told, I don't miss going to the gym, they were 80% effective. You see, when you say I can't or I shouldn't, you leave the door open to sin. When I told myself I really shouldn't eat these cookies, I would say, oh, I'll exercise afterwards. I'll go for a walk when I get home. I'll go to the gym and I'll burn it off but it never happened. I failed 90% of the time. When you say I don't sin, I don't do this, I don't do that, whatever it is you're struggling with right now, that conviction and determination gives you no wiggle room. It becomes part of you. I'm somebody that doesn't eat grandma's cookies. And how can you use this? I don't miss the readings. I don't miss attending Sunday school. I don't miss attending meeting. I don't look at a man or a woman the wrong way. I don't fill in the blank for yourself. This is absolutely effective. In fact, you know when Paul preached the gospel before Felix, Acts 24, 25, part of the message he taught Felix and Drusilla was righteousness and self-control. Brothers and sisters, if we're going to have self-control, we need to control ourselves and our desires. Start saying, I can't. Make that part of you. And just start with one. I can't miss my readings. And even if you just do one of them, you're starting off on the right foot. I don't miss my readings and make that part of your strategy in fighting sin. Do you know in the kingdom, it says that people will take hold of the skirts of the Jews and say, we have heard that God is with you. How much more you brothers and sisters, God is with you. What are you gonna tell 7.9 billion people when they say, how do I stop sinning? You can say, when I was a mortal, I really tried to exercise self-control. And I did it this way. I don't do this. I don't do that. And you're going to find that really helps. And, and brothers and sisters, how much better an answer is that than saying, well, I just kept sinning and I depended on the grace of the Lord. Well, that's all true. But what's Paul say? God forbid. God will save us. He will forgive us. But to make that our strategy, we can do better, brothers and sisters. I don't. Make it 
part of yourself. There's a book, as we wrap up, I want to strongly recommend. It's called Resisting the Devil. It's by Brother Robert Prinz. And I have found that really effective. And I just want to share one more thing. And I, I thank you for bearing with me. Brother Prinz in his book tells a story and he refers to an old movie on TV called the, the Princess Bride, if I remember. And in The Princess Bride, the princess has a farm hand named Wesley and she bosses him around the farm. And Brother Prince writes about this. And every time she tells young Wesley to do something, the princess, young Wesley will say, as you wish. And what that really meant from young Wesley was I love you. Young Wesley was in love with a princess and whatever she wanted, he would do. And his code word was, as you wish. And then Brother Prims brings out the point, when you find yourself being tempted, say to yourself, as you wish. Because in the very throes of temptation, what you're really saying, and you could say this too, I love you, Lord, and I'm going to stop thinking about this. And, and I do that as you wish when wrong things fill my head, which happens all the time. As you wish, I love you, Lord. And I stop doing it. What better reason to stop sinning than to remind yourself of your love for the Father, but even more important, his love for you. And, and just I'll share one more thought. Sometimes when I find myself sinning, and, and you will find this. When you're sinning, you will realize you're about to sin, that that thought is taking hold, and you're right there on the edge, balanced on a knife blade. You could say, as you wish, or, or I love you, Lord, and think of the lesson. Or sometimes I'll tell myself this verse, as men's hearts were evil continually, and then I stop. Those are things that help me break away from the world and as this pandemic is slowing and we're about to re-enter the world, I hope you find that helpful too. So thank you for your attention on this class and I'll see you back again at the next one.